Revelations chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. I will say this is a little bit different today. We'll see how it goes, because I don't even know. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I'm not going to go there today, but... I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name. Yeah, they ain't playing tiddlywinks and singing little tiny fluffy songs, okay? This is real business right here. Are you, are you with me still? Okay. And hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. That word seat is literally thronos or throne where Satan's throne is. Now let's go ahead and get it more in our vernacular, while everybody feels warm and fuzzies because you've read it before, the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Amen. Again, in verse 10, if you say, if you're there, say amen. amen. Finally, my, my brethren, be strong in the Lord yes. and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the trickery, the sinister trickery. Trust me, you think all this stuff in the world is just going, no, 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 no. They're, hey, these, you see all this stuff going on with, 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 with abortions and babies out of wedlock and, and, and men beating on women and all this crazy stuff. There's something behind that. It ought not to be that way. God didn't create us to treat one another like that. And they, there's some sinister trickery going on. And the world is so good at it, it made, you, it made some people, you're here today and you think, well, this is kind of weird. Oh, no, no, no. The fact that you're comfortable out there and not in here. When I have a problem in my car, I take it back to its maker. When I got trouble, I won't get to my maker. All right. Are you, are you with me? I'm not trying to be too complicated today. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me just give you a little quick pastoral commercial here. Isn't it kind of neat that the wickedness wants to get to high places, but God is so great that he wants to get to low places. Yeah, I, I, I was raised in church, but I was also living in the world. So unlike that country singer, I got friends in low places. Stay with me today. We're going we're gonna to have church. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Are you hearing me? And having done all, to stand. Let's just place our Bibles down. Let's lift up our hands. Let's give glory to God. And God, open my heart and my mind and Lord, allow the, the seed of the word to be planted in the fertile soil of my soul. I need you today, God. I need your help. Not only do I want to withstand the evil of today, I want to stand for the things of God during the evil of this day. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. Kind of a strange title with what I read, but before today, not too many of you were jumping up and down going, man, Antipas was a pretty cool guy. You talked about Paul, or you talked about David, or Moses, and you didn't talk about this obscure person. But before I get too much further, let me lay down some spiritual framework here. In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, it says, casting down imaginations. 
This is something you have to do every day. In fact, in all honesty, you never stop doing this. If you were here Wednesday night, I, 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 I use the term dusting for this. You got to be dusting every day. If you don't know it, get online and listen to the message. It might be lengthy, but it's worth it. And then after you're done, you know it's going to help you. Just go ahead and send in an offering. Amen. You know, I know what Yeah, never heard me say something like that ever in your whole life. But never heard me talk about money. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. But listen. You just can't cast it down. You have to control what you're thinking. And bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Because every deed begins as a thought. So the Old Testament people get stuck in and they think, you know what, well, if I don't do it, I'm okay. Well, it would, if you read the Old Testament, it didn't work out too good for a lot of folks. Well, can, can, so Jesus stepped it up a little bit. said, no, nah, you know what? If you think it. So in other words, take it back. I don't want to even think like that. Okay, okay. Are you with me? We are the people of God. You aren't just baptized in Jesus' name and full of the Holy Ghost so that you can speak in tongues. That's not what it's for. But we are those that are, are supposed to stand in direct opposition and conflict to the enemy of our souls. We are to be the ones to stand up uh, when wrong is being done to point to the right. That is what we're there for. Ephesians and 6, 6 and tells to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the, stand against, The word wiles is methods, it's his trickery. You can't defeat devils you're dancing with. You can't hold hands with the devil all week and come in on saying, I got the victory. You ain't got nothing but confusion on your hands. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Bible goes so far and it, it, it says, uh, no, you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Some of you are just getting along too well out there. And you're uncomfortable in here. I'll have an altar call here at the end. I always do. And it's funny how many will stay in their seats and I'll say, let me get comfortable in an altar. It's just truth. It's just truth. It's just our, our nature and our flesh. And we, and we have all these excuses that we buy in our mind, but God's like, oh no. I know what you're thinking. You can't even get that under control to obey and listen and, and even give enough credence to say, I need to be an altar getting a hold of God. Anybody ever been told to pray through? Yes. Didn't work too good, just made you mad, didn't it? So the, 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 the battle is real. Okay. I got to thinking about this and I got to realize, you know what? There's a lot of notable prayers in the word of God. Are you with me? Paul made, made, that, made that prayer. In Ephesians chapter 1, he said, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Yes. Are you hearing me? Hannah's prayer was pretty amazing. In fact, it's 10 verses long. I'm just going to get a portion of it here. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Wow. The prayer of Jabez. What an amazing prayer. And he called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast that thine hand might be with me and thou mightest, that thou wouldest keep me from evil. God, keep me from evil. Keep me from evil. God granted him that which he requested. Hezekiah's prayer in 2 Kings, Solomon's prayer for wisdom in 1 Kings, the dedication of the temple of Solomon's prayer, David's prayers. He cried out to the Lord in every area of his life. 
And he had a couple extra areas, folks. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? He had the prayer for favor in Psalm 60, a prayer of repentance, and everybody knows, Psalms 51. Prayer for help in trouble, Psalms 43. Prayer for safety from enemies, Psalms 57. Prayer for mercy, prayer for wisdom and forgiveness. You have to understand something. Everything by prayer and supplication. We, prayer is communication. In other words, I'm in constant communication with God. Even Jonah prayed. That's another message. It took him a little bit to wake up. Some of us, some of us like to dwell and hang out in our messes. There's the Lord's Prayer and Jesus' prayer for his disciples. But in our text today, to the angel of the church of Pergamon, write, I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Mm. Today, all that's left of the city of Pergamum, now in modern-day Turkey, is really ruins. But when the Apostle John wrote this letter to the church there, it was one of the most influential cities of the Roman Empire. Pergamon had the unique status that it was different than any other city because, are you ready? It was the political center. Oh yeah, now I'm messing with some of y'all. Y'all got to turn off that Fox News this week, hallelujah. It was from Pergamon that all the rulings that were made affected the whole area of Asia Minor. The people of Pergamon were inventors, innovators. They perfected a parchment in that day that was made out of calf skin. There was a developer, just couldn't run down to Walmart and get yourself a slab of paper. And they built the world's first, first psychiatric center or hospital. There's a correlation if you listen, let me get through some of this. Pergamon was also a well-known center for the arts. The, sit, the city's theater at that time sat 10,000 people a night. Psychiatric, arts, theater. <laughs> in fact, in that theater, the acoustics were so good and designed and so much effort was put into it that a whisper on stage could be heard all the way to the top row. The city's Acropolis rivaled that of Athens in Greece. And its library was the second largest in the ancient world. In fact, the collection was so great, if you know your history, the Roman general Mark Antony presented it as a wedding gift to Cleopatra. Now, I don't know if she was the type to read, but I don't know. <laughs> At the end of the first century, Pergamon was a thriving city. It was the hustle and bustle. In fact, probably a lot like America is today. So why does the book of Revelation call it the dwelling place of Satan? Are you with me today? I know I told you it's going to be different. I'm normally blowing and going and sweating. I may be able to give this back to you. But I just, I just, I, I really have a small thought and I just, I need to, I need to surround it with some stuff. So hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll get a hold of you and you'll get some meat out of this today. The answer that's why the book of Revelation calls it that, lies within the ruins of the city temples because on one side is a very beautiful city, but on the other side, on the flip side, it was one of the darkest, most sinister cities in the whole Roman Empire. The people of Pergamon were known as the temple keepers of Asia. The city had three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor, another for the goddess of Athena, and the great altar of Zeus, the king of the Greek gods. Now, many scholars believe that this altar, this is the throne of Satan, mentioned in the book of Revelation. The word throne, that I told you is a seat, is used in a personal private residence. That's the connotation here. And it was a chair 
for the Lord of the house, the master of the house. Now, I have a chair in my home. It's, it's kind of designated as, as mine. It, but it, it's just, it's not called that. It's called the prayer chair because it's, it's, I sit in it. I prepare my messages there. And so I have a designated chair in my home. So anybody have one of those? You have a place you sit. So the word throne was used. And uh, the very fact that Jesus would use this word means that Satan felt at home there. He's going to have a chair when he feels at home there. You have to ask, does he have a chair there? He sat on the throne, and that meant it was his territory. He was master of that house. The city also had what is called the, a healing center called the Asclepion. Asclepion, let me say it right. It was a difficult word to play with. It was built in honor of Asclepios, the Greek serpent god in the first century. This was a cross between a hospital and a health spa. Now, one of the number one things today in, in America, where patients could go and get everything from a mud bath to major surgery. Emperors from all the way from Rome would come and be treated there but it was no ordinary doctor's visit. They had a rule. If you were a terminal patient, you were not allowed to go into the Asclepian. The Asclepian priest didn't want anyone hearing that someone had died in the Asclepian. We're not going to tell the truth about some things. We're going to make it always look like everything's wonderful. There was a huge sign just above the official entrance to the Asclepian that said, death is not permitted here. Kind of the opposite of walking in church, isn't it? For those of you that understand the spirit. So the only way you're going to get in to begin with is if they already knew you were going to live. Patients entered through an underground tunnel, and they were given a sedative to drink, and they spent the night in dormitories of the Asclepian where non-poisonous snakes, remember remember who, who, who it was too, were crawling around all at night. Now, it ain't like in here. We just flip on these LEDs and you can see everything that's going on. When it got dark there, well, I don't know, maybe you got a candle or two, but I've never really wanted to redo a candle or be in a room. With, it didn't work for me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They were told that the serpent goddess Clippian would speak to them in their dreams and give them a diagnosis. It was believed that the snakes carried the healing power of Asclepios, and if a snake slithered across you while you were sleeping at night, that was a divine sign that healing power was coming to you. Now, don't get all upset. Go look at some of our medical symbols today, and you'll see. See, y'all think I'm way out in left field, but you're living right in the middle of what I'm talking about. So the next morning, the patients told their dreams to priests who then prescribed their treatments. Finally, the patients made clay, <laughs> maybe it's playtime, I don't know, clay statues or forms of the body parts that needed healing and offered them to Asclepius. Now, I'd have fit in right there. You can give me a little Play-Doh. I, I can have fun with that all day long, you know, get right in there. The people of Pergamum worshiped a, a, a myriad of Greek and Roman gods. But when Christianity arrived with the belief of one God, the city's pagan priests went on attack, and their most famous victim was the man named Antipas. And that sheds light for us on why it's written in the book of Revelation, Jesus called Antipas, my faithful martyr. He was the Christian bishop of Pergamum. He was the leader of the Christian faith in the midst of all that evil. He was ordained by the Apostle John, and his faith got the attention of the priests of Asclepios. It was, it was, it was, it was said Antipas had cast out so many devils that the demons had been complaining to the pagan. I'm going to say it again. 
he had cast, Antipas had caused so much havoc. He was, remember what I said a moment ago? See, y'all think I'm, I'm, I'm playing half the time. He was an upsetter. He was turning things upside down. Okay, he wasn't going to allow the status quo of all the evil. Now, you can jump and shout, and you should. But I'm going to talk about what you're allowing in your home, what you're allowing in your mind, what you're allowing in your heart. You need the Holy Ghost to rise up and be an upsetter. Say, no more. We'll we'll cast some of this out. We're going to cast some imaginations down and throw some junk out. Are you hearing me? So he had cast out so many demons and devils. That is, they said that the spirits were talking to the, the Asclepios worshipers that you've got to do something about this Antipas. You've got to get rid of this guy. He's, he's overturning what we're trying to establish. And the pagan priests went to the Roman governor and complained that the prayers of Antipas were driving their spirits out of the city and hindering their worship. Of their gods. I don't know why you think this is far-fetched. That's your job too. Who said that? That's our job. That's what we're supposed to be doing right now. Now, now I know we got a little carpet. We got our cute little chairs and air conditioning. Oh, now we got a little black wall and some TV. But I hate to break it to you. That's not what we're about. We're to be turning this world upside down and speaking against the evil. Hey, all you girls that don't want to be abused, you ought to hate rap music. You riding around with Joker listening to that, something's wrong with you. It's talking about going against authority and doing drugs and treating you like a trick. Hey, you're the one being tricked. You got to turn that junk up. You can't live in that mess and be a part of it and think you're going to walk into a wonderful home. You got to cast that stuff out. In other words, it can't be in here either. You got to cast. Oh, Antipas. You didn't hear about him. You didn't know about him. But Jesus sure knew who he was. He was a faithful martyr. So as punishment for Antipas, the governor ordered Antipas to offer a sacrifice of wine and incense to the statue of the Roman emperor and declare that the emperor was Lord and God. Anybody want to gander or take a guess as to what Antipas did? He refused. Now understand, if you rejected the divinity of the emperor, now see, you're not putting this together today because you don't realize. I watched a doctor video himself being kicked out of his job yesterday. Now I know y'all don't want to talk it, and we don't want to get all there, and I get by, and I'm not trying to go there, but you need to understand what's happening today. See, some of you want to play. Some of you say, want to come. I, want every, I want to feel so connected to the church. Hey, I, I, I want this. And, I, and you have missed it. You are so worried about your touchy little feelings that what are you bringing to the table? Are you bringing prayer in here when you come in here? Are you bringing the spirit of God in here and a powerful idea that I'm going to stand up against the things? That, or are you constantly walking around buying into the idea out there that everything's to be catered to you? Antipas stood against that and was sentenced to death on the altar of Zeus. Satan's throne. Satan, see, are you hearing what I'm saying? You need to listen. Some of you need to get spiritual because you're going to trip your own self up. Now, most of the altar exists still today. And surrounding are some of the world's most famous marble sculptures or friezes, as they're called. And they depict the uh, gigantomy. The real weird, weird word, which is a term used for the battle between the Greek gods and giants, all that mystical stuff. At the very top of the altar was a giant hollow bronze bull. Hmm. It was designed for human sacrifice. The method of execution suffered by Antipas is they took him 
and placed him and tied him inside the bull in such a way that his head was in the head of the bull. They would close up the bull and take wood and fill up the hole underneath of it and light it on fire. And as it heated up, the bull basically turned in an oven. And as it burnt, roasted, and cooked Antipas, the whole idea behind it is because his head was in the head of the bull, it would bring the bull to life with his own moans and screams as he was dying. So his death was bringing life in their idea to their bronze statue. Look, this is not some hokey stuff a preacher's talking about. You can go, this is history. You can go read this. But I did the research for you, so just get the tape now. Well, CD, whatever we got. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You gotta imagine those cries echoing through that bronze body and coming out the pipes and the tubes that were made to come out through the nostrils and the mouth of that bull. But it is recorded that even in the midst of the burning and the flames, Sister Crystal, this elder Antipas died, and all they could hear coming out of that bull was him praying for his church. Wow. The year was AD 92, a few years later, and the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, mentioning the death of Antipas of Pergamon. Antipas has been gone for centuries and mostly forgotten, but he is remembered in the scripture of our text today. Today, all that is left there in Pergamum is the foundation because this altar of Zeus, the seat of Satan, is now more than a thousand miles away. In the 19th century, how many German engineers dismantled the altar and took it to Berlin? The so-called throne of Satan went on display in the city's Pergamon Museum in 1930. Just in time to inspire one of the most famous brutal dictators the world had ever seen. Are you hear what I'm saying? The most significant praise in heaven will not be the four and twenty elders, nor will it be the praise of the angels or prophets. The greatest praise that will be heard will flow from the mouth of the great I am when he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There will be no greater sound that is made for your ears and mine. I'm talking about a memorial to an unknown site. I'm talking about people today that are praying in the midst of this chaos, living for God in the midst of this mess and not allowing what is going on to stop you from being the saint that God has called you to be. Why we're faithful day in and day out and why we care about the church and why we care about reading the Bible and having a home dedicated to God. Are you hearing me? Discontentment, covetousness, and the spirit of criticism are treasure stealers, ministry killers, church splitters, tools of the enemy. Contentment, thankfulness, and appreciation are the treasures God would have you and I to possess toward him. It's what he has chosen for us in his abundant wisdom. If Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and he has, I need you listening. Where does this thief gain access? Oh, I don't have to think of that. How does he pull off this great heist? How does he commit this heinous murder and carry out this destruction? Y'all read that, but you've never thought about answering that. Any more than you consider trying to find out about this guy named Antipas that seems so obscure. How does Satan pull this off? How does he steal, kill, and destroy? Through the avenues of unguarded 
negative thinking through the discontent dialogue of a prideful, prayerless self -hook. The thief will do all he can to distract you. Distract you with what you think could be or what could have been and cause you to miss the virtue in what is around you right now. I wonder if Antipas, when all that was going on, thought, well, shucks, why am I going through this? Or, well, wait a minute now. I, well, the sister so-and-so offended. They didn't shake my hand today. I, I wasn't asked to do an answer. I, I, I didn't get to say, I wonder if you got a little sideways worrying about the uh, church catering to his sensitive little feelings. Or, or maybe he was too busy praying. And maybe he was too busy fasting. And maybe he was too busy preaching. Or maybe he's too busy being committed. You know, I got a real devil to fight. I got a real enemy I'm dealing with. I don't want to fight my brother or my sister. I want to fight the enemy. We know through scripture that God gives every person different talents. Some 10 and some one. Are you hearing me? Those are easy numbers, especially for even the likes of me. The truth is some receive and gain even more than that. You can complain and you can bellyache and you can criticize. However, you must realize God is intent for your salvation and peace of mind to possess you. And I believe he would know that if you had what you think you want, it might actually destroy you and I'll put you in a place where the enemy has easier access. So when he says no, you ought to be okay. Because some of you might be heading headlong into a situation like Antipas, and I don't know how many of you are going to be willing to do that when a headache will keep you out of the house of God. Honestly, in my... I don't even know how long I've been in this now. I've done for God, 35 years. I've seen more of the greatest gifted, talented, privileged people than I care to mention that have made shipwreck of their lives on opportunities and gifts that they think they want. I'm going to say something here that may shock some of you. I want what God has for me and nothing else. I, 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 some of us have, have made shipwreck of our own lives and tripped our own selves up because you wanted something, but you didn't consider the eternal cost of it. You could financially afford it, but you never considered that it was going to bring on prayerlessness, that it was going to bring on faithlessness, that it was going to bring on whatever it is that kept you from reaching the heights that you could have reached. Sadly, we are programmed wrong in America. Our ego thinks it's about being seen and heard and respected and treasured for our gift. I come walking in here, bless God. Y'all need to be excited to know me. When I walk in the room, everybody. I've been around people. They talk like that. I, I believe God is looking for someone to use. The Bible tells us his eyes run to and fro. He's, you telling me stop doing it? You're telling me right now you're sitting there wondering what to do next. God, if you're so available, God said, you know what? I need someone to clean the bathroom right now. <laughs> well, I don't get seen enough glory in that. Well, now we go back to the problem. You need to understand that what's not often, not often regarded is he may choose to make your most remarkable opportunities to be done in obscurity. And I hope you'll have enough wisdom to embrace it. It is a higher calling to pray than it is to preach. See, I'm talking about a memorial of the unknown saint to that person who prays even when no one hears it. Oh, to the person who gave and no one recognized it. The person who helped for years in a very little, small, yet consistent way. 
and made a difference in the life of countless peoples because they merely just stayed faithful and didn't cause a problem. They weren't always looking for the next place to go or the next, I'd be better over here because they found out that the ministry, real ministry and real living for God isn't what you get, but what you give. And countless seemingly forgotten people who have faithfully labored in obscurity and today are buried and seemingly forgotten and no one seems to know their name and they, you don't, they're just barely mentioned in scripture like an antipas and I can say that there are families and there are homes and there are churches and there are ministries thriving today because someone was willing to gain godly satisfaction, yet a simple power of remaining obedient. There are memorials here on this earth to saints that are long gone. Now, these memorials aren't going to be visited like Washington, D.C., or Rome. However, every church, every believer today is a living memorial to generations of obedient saints and preachers who did their best with what they had. That God today would give you an eye more than a deep knowledge of the past or a powerful vision of the future. Let us see fully right now what is available and standing in front of us and available right now. What can you do right now? Your, 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 your greatest moment was not yesterday. You have today. Your greatest moment is right now. What will you be? What will you do See, I'm trying to wake someone up today, and I know this is different than how I normally preach, but you are in your finest hour right now. Don't miss it, Antipas. Don't squander it. Don't waste it. Uh, you have to understand, Jonah made his own ministry miserable. You were called to the ministry, but you made it miserable because you wanted things God didn't want to give you. You wanted to do things that would have destroyed you. And so you jumped and you jumped and you did this or you got bitter or you got angry or you questioned God because you went through some pain. Jonah said himself, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. Wait a minute. Weren't you just called to go and now you're... What? And, they, and he told the story to these guys, and they said, well, why have you done this? Well, the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord. You see, Jonah's not the anomaly, really, because how many of us know we've got a call of God in our life? Now, I'm, I'm going to get you business, but when's the last time you won somebody? When's the last time you did something for the kingdom of God, not because it punched your accounting card, but because you're all in. You only have today. You have right now. Your, your mark is being made. If you're waiting for a moment, hello? Stop waiting. It's already waiting on you. Be faithful, be prayerful, and therefore you are powerful. Paul told us, and I believe Paul understood this. He said, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light and let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness, not in strife and everything. Some of you are so, well, I'm not going to do that because they're doing it now and I'm not doing this and I can't, you know, work good with people. you got to pray through. God's called you for such a time as this, but you can't do nothing because it's about you and not about him. Oh, the devil is a liar. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Are you hearing me? Because that's what we have. 
that's going to help us do what we must. The essence of the calling of God is to faithfully work, pray, and be a blessing. That's today. That's right now. That's not next week. That's not next month. That's now, every now. Today is now. And that's how a memorial, a ministry follows you. It's where you are right now. <laughs> it's okay to say, I think God has more for me to do. Good. I believe we all do as well. However, some people never get there because they're not living in the now. Prove yourself faithful at this moment. Qualify yourself for the next one now. If you're waiting for your turn, you've missed your opportunity. Oh, you know where you find it? You don't find it behind a pulpit. You find it in prayer. See, the problem is, is it, it, let's just be real. It, someone got mad at me. You need to give them more time to prepare. Well, you're not living as a Christian every day. Well, I got to get my heart right. Oh, that means your heart's not right. Look, I, 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 look. You have to understand, it's only the enemy that doesn't want you to be successful. Don't think the church, the church, you got a calling, right? You got the opportunities right now. There's nothing holding you back. You are as spiritual as you want to be. You're as prayerful as you want to be. You want to have tears and fingerprints and claw marks on this altar. But sadly, some have excelled beyond that. An altar calls for you new folks. I, 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 I wonder if Antipas would say that while he was in that bull. How many times have we heard family church stories where a grand, great-grandmother was heard and had heard this apostolic message and in an old brush arbor in a small community. Or great grandpa or someone and the story is passed down and people talk about grandma, people talk about grandpa. And then you realize years later that the church now sits on their property because, because they were all in and now it's no surprise when, they, when, when you realize, wait, wait a minute, that was your grandmother and you're the pastor now? You see, you have to understand something. When you start measuring and you start splitting hairs with God, you're splitting yourself off. When you start thinking, I'm waiting for a better opportunity for me, you just missed your greatest one, the one that you really have. How much money did grandma give all those decades? Does it matter? How many prayers did she pray? How, how many tears did she shed? How many kind words and notes of encouragement did she share? There's no record, but there's a memorial to that unknown saint because there's a church. There's prayer. People still praying. People still fasting. People still standing against the wickedness of this world. There's a memorial around you right now. You are to be a memorial. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Everyone has some form of a story. This church has a story. It was very sad to me last year when I got notified by the Stinnett's family, Brother Stinnett's family, that he had passed. Blew my, it just enjoyed him coming there. He was one of the integral people that, that, that put the original building here. Daughter lives down the street, and yet years later, even after not coming here for years, there's still a connectedness. You have to understand, you want that connectedness to the things of God. If you leave anything to anybody, it ought to be a memorial to the church. God is not, God is not unrighteous to forget your labor. So, in fact, I'll be, I want to hurt some feelings here. You probably offended God with your ideology when you think about the church. You are so concerned about these worldly things and you turn around and treat the church like, well, I don't know if I, and God's like, wait a minute. Oh, wait, 
I gave you all that and now you're like, you don't want to. God doesn't forget. God's accounting is perfect. His records are clear and in order. God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You, you, you're doing yourself harm when you start thinking, well, I don't know about the church and I don't know about the pastor. And I don't, well, let me tell you something. Come in here and be a stalwart saint. Lead footprints of memorial in a prayer room at an altar in praise and music and worship and everything that needs to be done around that. You ought to be a memorial yourself to some unknown saint. I stand here today to preach. Some of you have never met. You may have heard of my pastor, but I am a memorial to someone you don't know. God is faithful. God is just. And if you think if you you think you start getting stingy with the church or you start getting and treat the things of the world greater than the church, trust me, God's like, really? God will hand out our rewards. Count on it. Count on it. Our world will not be received in this world our reward was always intended to be there on that great day of the lord when all the dead in christ shall rise we'll have a new body hallelujah we'll have a new life hallelujah keep pressing saint of god keep pushing saint of god keep living keep praying keep get why because i'm going to be a memorial keep being a blessing there's a payday coming someday. I, I, I know we sat there and we and we heard the story of Antipas. Let me tell you something. He speaks today. His life spurs me on today. I've never met him. He's unknown to me. But when I think a man can have that kind of faith, my God, Antipas, what a memorial you are. I never knew you, but my God, if I can get a hold of what you had. And like I said, that greatest sound is when we hear the Savior of our soul say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You ain't going to hear that if you're upset at the church. You ain't going to hear you ain't going to hear that if you're always mad at the pastor and always looking for someplace else to go. God is going to put an opportunity in your lap today. What are you going to do with it? Can I tell you, it's not essential to be remembered here on this earth. Because Jesus knows your name in heaven. I had some song lyrics here I was going to sing, but I want to bring this to a close. Every year I put effort into try to reading, try reading the entire Bible all the way through. I get stuck sometimes because you guys know how I like to study. And go, oh, wow, a word. Like, <laughs> another one. What's that one mean? <laughs> As Sister Verdell every year, it kind of ends with Revelation. And people still argue and debate it today as practical th- being a theology fan. I really don't want to debate on what might happen when God comes back. Because I'm sincerely more concerned about just being ready. Not on when and how the end will happen. But I'm deeply concerned that I'm ready and you're ready. I know, so, man, he's getting intense. He's getting serious. I want you ready. I, 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 you know, you have no idea how bad I want you walking streets of gold. I want, I, I, <laughs> I don't, it doesn't matter what your view on the end time is. There's a story within this book. That you now know. That back story to Antipas when you now realize that. And that little verse, that little, that little halfway through chapter two, that reference to Satan's throne. Well, first of all, what Satan has a throne? If that don't stop you while you're reading your Bible, that yeah, wait a minute, and you're reading words and you're not reading. Kind of missed that before. He was a faithful witness killed of where Satan lives. Hey, saints, did you hear that? Yeah. Faithful witness. Three simple words. 
don't know how I'd like that to be said about my life. I know I don't make sense to a lot of people. But if this man in the city of Pergamon, that was his evil as it was and have that influence that darkness and they called it literally the throne of Satan and it's interesting and it does capture my mind the facts about this man named Antipas Jesus mentions him to John Antipas my Faithful martyr, my faithful witness. Maybe I'm by myself today. Can you imagine? Can you just, in your mind's eye, I know I've, I've, I've got like the Cartoon Network going on in my head. I know that. I, I know I'm animated in my thinking, but he prayed in such a way that it said the evil spirits went to the pagan world. Get him to stop. Get him to stop. Can you imagine living for God in such a way that the devils of hell, get him to stop. Get him to stop. Stop. You're turning what I'm doing upside down. Get him to stop. Get him to stop praying. Kill him. Kill him. Get rid of him. He's stopping what I'm doing. I dare say that when evil spirits start waking people up to complain about you, you're doing something right. <laughs> Ah, he was, Antipas was targeted. Brutally murdered. Burned to death on the altar of Zeus in a hollow bronze bull. I don't know what it sounded like. I know they expected the sounds of moaning and groaning of someone dying. But can you imagine Instead, hearing a faithful saint praying for his church. You know, Antipas never wrote a letter. There's no book in the Bible that bears his name. We don't even have a sermon he preached. But we know his life and his prayer changed things. As we all stand today, if you get anything out of this service, and I apologize, it's not my normal way to preach. I, anybody, anybody here today can make a difference. Anyone can find a place to pray. No, you don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be able to orate. You don't have to be able to dress or a fork. Anybody can pray. There was no fanfare for Antipas. No platform. No promotion. Just a faithful prayer life. Oh, Jesus, you may not think you're a good witness, a good singer, a good leader, a good speaker, but I tell you what you can do well. You can pray. You can pray. You can pray. The invite's there. The door's open. I don't want to be known by my hobbies or habits. I want to be known for someone that will pray and pray and pray. It is one of the only things we're admonished to do without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. 